Okay. Uh, uh, probably this might be a slightly different uh, emphasis or focus. So it's, 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 it's doesn't concern so much Northern Ireland, but I think that uh, someone can easily internalize some of the conclusions of, of my presentation in order to reconsider the structure and the nature of uh, fiscal policy. So the, the basic point of what I would like to emphasize today is that uh, sovereign debt still remains a big issue in uh, advanced or developed capitalist uh, economies. It might not reach the headlines as it used to be in the past, but this does not mean that it has ceased to exist as a problem. It is there, and in a very silent but effective way, it influences the decision-making to significant extent. Uh, so based on this assumption, I think, or what I would try to do with this, with this presentation, which is based on the proposal, which was drafted in 2014 in the context of the European Union sovereign debt crisis, is to try to argue that central banking or contemporary nature of monetary policy, at least as it was developed in the, uh, in the wake of 2008, global financial meltdown might not be a bad idea to reconsider uh, the, the problem. At, at the more, at the more uh, specific level, this might also be more interesting for this room. Uh, the argument suggests that we cannot think or consider a fiscal policy in general or fiscal autonomy or decentralization, if you want, uh, independently from central banking and monetary policy. So this is another lesson that someone should draw from, from, things, for, from, from how things have been developed in the wake of 2007. And I will try to make the point by referring to an illustration which was designed in the case of the European Union, but as I told you, uh, the uh, results can easily uh, be generalized in different contexts as well. So, okay, yes. so let's try to figure out the size of uh, the problem. What we see in this figure is the levels of sovereign debt uh, for several countries in the three different years. Um, uh, as a ratio to GDP, as, and as you can see, there is an uh, increasing tendency after 2007, which is something we already know. And we can see that most of these countries are, are, are struggling or are left at, with a levels which, which are comparable to 100%. So when some of these countries are beyond that uh, threshold. And this is a major issue, this is a big problem. So in order to understand the importance of this problem, allow me to uh, proceed with a simple illustration. Forget about, forget about, so I, I, will not, I, will not, I will not discuss this. But this is a very simple uh, accounting identity. I, I will explain, don't forget about the numbers. Everything there is in terms of ratios of GDP. And this is an accounting identity which in very plain work says that the increase in sovereign debt or the debt dynamics is related to uh, the primary surplus, that is the difference between the revenue and the cost if, uh, or the expenditure if we do not include uh, the tax expenditure, the interest rate expenditure. Uh, the relation of growth to the servicing of debt and then inflation. So this is very simple. This is what it says. And I say, as I told you, this is an accounting identity in a sense that it's not a causal equation. So it doesn't show how the debt is defined. Why? Because we can easily think of or prove on the basis of uh, evidence of the existing literature that there are very complex interconnections between these terms. So, you know, growth influences uh, the primary surplus, inflation, or the debt has. So there, there are very simple interconnections in this uh, equation, but they help us to understand or to be more specific of the size of the problem. So if we assume a hypothetical economy in which the sovereign debt is equal to the GDP, which is not far away from the sample of the countries I just saw you, and if we assume an anticipated long-term real growth at the level of 2%, which is very optimistic, it's very optimistic according to 
contemporary forecasts about the far future. This means that economies with inflation of at the level of 1 or 2 percent would have to grow for a long time at the ratio of 3 to 4 percent, which is very, very high. Uh, so it's, this is an optimistic uh, uh, assumption. A real effective interest rate, which is the interest rates on the total outstanding debt at the level of 3 percent, which is by and large uh, close to what exists in this sample. This means that this country, this hypothetical country, in order to stabilize the increasing tendency of debt, will have to have a, foreign, a, a primary surplus of the level of 1% of GDP forever, just to stabilize that. And this is austerity, this is very important. This is, we're talking about a huge fiscal adjustments need to be made by economies just to stabilize these increasing turns. Okay, so this is the first uh, conclusion. Of course, debt or sovereign debt has a different aspect as well because it is, you know, a financial liability. Uh, and it means that, you know, it circulates in the market. It receives a price based on uh, a particular interpretation of a series of economic, social and political uh, events. So these prices fluctuates and this affects the yields and the servicing of, of, of debt. We also know that this is very closely interlinked to the structure of the contemporary financial system. Why? Because sovereign debt is a basic instrument in the organization, not only of the traditional financial system, but of the so-called uh, side door banking system. So there is a great need or demand for safe government assets in order to secure a safe uh, proceeding or safe workings of the financial sector. Why, why the basic idea of contemporary finance is collateralized loans. So this is the nature. So this is very, very important. And if the fact that, you know, you have a financial dimension of debt, it means that countries or small countries with a very weak currency will have a big trouble. Why? Because it's not just the limitations imposed by the previous equation. It's also a very huge discipline or supervision provided by the markets, which somehow eliminates even the minor room that might exist in order to have uh, meaningful fiscal or expansionary fiscal policies. So uh, things are quite different in big countries, that is countries with a very strong currency uh, and of course, our monetary union. So the thing there is that there are in place mechanisms that can interfere with this uh, supervisionary role of the market. And that's why the issue of debt becomes more political, uh, an issue of political conflict or political debate. And my proposal fits to this second country, second category of, of uh, countries. So what are the three major limitations? I would just repeat things that I said before in the discussion of the equation is that uh, deflationary fiscal adjustments uh, cannot be a solution to the problem. Uh, and of course, you know, there's plenty of historical and econometric evidence which says that solely relying on persistent primary surpluses or privatizations, even if someone says that this is a good thing, of course, this is an issue of debate, uh, it's not a solution to the problem. So huge austerity might be enough in order to stabilize the increasing the dynamics, but it cannot be a solution for a, 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 a very important reduction of the sovereign debt. So what, with, what, I mean, what we face here is a very important strategic dilemma. And uh, I mean, Parts of this discussion here, which were focused on the Northern Ireland economy, are very important in order to influence the decision making, but to some extent are related in their own rights with this big, you know, uh, policy making dilemma, which is uh, uh, main, ma the major economy, economies uh, encounter in our days. So it's like austerity forever, or further reductions and, and, and further retreat of the welfare states or unconventional or unorthodox policies which can uh, provide the ground of a radical solution to this problem. So this is the basic dilemma. And referring to the, the idea of unorthodox or unconventional solutions before the crisis, 
might be considered something, you know, that we cannot discuss or something which is a fantasy in the minds of economic historians like me. Because, you know, if we go in the, and, and watch and look at the past episodes of economic policy, we can see plenty of episodes of unconventional or unorthodox monetary interventions. But uh, after 2007, this is the benchmark. So, you know, central banks and monetary policy has stepped into the ground. It has changed in nature at least uh, the basic uh, conditions in which, uh, upon which it was, uh, it was perceived before uh, the crisis. And now the permanent character of the monetary policy is unconventional or unorthodox major intervention into the market. So this is uh, just a snapshot of the balance sheet of uh, the Bank of England. So this is the, the asset side. And it gives you the, uh, the nature or the significance of the monetary interventions. The majority of this intervention has to do with securities, not only private, but different forms of public, uh, of, uh, not only public, but different forms of private debt. The black line uh, measures the, the size of the balance sheet as a ratio to GDP. And we can see that on the left hand, uh, hand, hand, uh, the left hand side uh, axis. And we can see that uh, the size of the balance sheet was uh, around 5% of GDP just before the crisis. And now after huge interventions, uh, without being able to stabilize so much the economy, the size has reached, you know, or fluctuates around 25% of GDP. This is huge and this is flags and indicates a tremendous nature in uh, the workings of monetary policy. So the idea is that if we have a policy, a game, game changer uh, in the context, perhaps we can use this new condition or this new nature of monetary policy to reconsider or at least discuss uh, the problem of sovereign indebtedness. A uh, similar picture uh, also applies to other major central banks. This is the, uh, the structure of the asset side of balance sheet of the Fed. And this is the euro system. Uh, as you can see from the left-hand side axis, uh, vertical axis, the levels, the, the black line also measures uh, uh, the, 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 the amount of asset as a ratio to GDP uh, we also see fluctuations around 20 or 30 percent of GDP of the Eurozone. So all this, the size is comparable to each other in terms of, of GDP. Maybe the portion is different because we have different financial and uh, systems. I wouldn't like, to, I don't have the time to go into detail. So the question uh, is how much is the firepower of the central bank in order to see what we can do or how would be an efficient and productive way to use this firepower in order to radically tame the, prov the problem of sovereign indebtedness. So I, I, I would just you know, highlight or I would just briefly like to discuss the firepower of monetary uh, contemporary central banking in the context of an illustration. And this is based on a proposal which was drafted in 2014 and 2015 for the European Union system. But E easily can, the results or the conclusions can be used in different uh, cases. And the question uh, for the Eurozone uh, was that uh, could be a radical uh, solution to the sovereign debt crisis for the whole uh, of the monetary union era, area. So for all countries belonging to the Euro which doesn't violate the fundamental tenets of uh, the, 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 the policy making at the Eurozone. That is, could we uh, envisage or could, could we describe a solution to the debt which does, is not rely, it's, it doesn't rely on debt write-off or forgiveness. Uh, it doesn't rely on direct fiscal transfers. Um, it doesn't need any additional tax in any country. And most importantly, it is fully sterilized, which is, doesn't uh, result in an increase 
on the monetary basis. So can someone use the firepower of the monetary system without violating all these basic tenets of, of uh, the European framework? And the answer is yes, and I will try to briefly describe the logic. So we can imagine a solution that has two different moments. So the first moment, uh, the European Central Banks buy and creates uh, takes and creates uh, uh, all, all, uh, takes all debt maturing in the five years between 2016 and 2020. You know, this is not arbitrary. It indicates the period in which this proposal was drafted, but of course, a, new, a similar exercise can be also follow up in, in a different time period. So the ECB takes all debt maturing and all related interest payment within these five years. And it capitalized this amount into a zero coupon bonds. And then you have individual agreements between the central bank and its individual country to buy back this uh, security when it reaches 20% of GDP. Why? Why? Because we have a discounting rate, but this discounting rate is uh, smaller than the growth. So eventually the nominal or the market value of this security will fall. At some point we'll reach 20% of GDP. So there is a buyback condition on uh, the central bank. All, this, uh, all these calculations are fully, are based on the assumption that every transaction is fully sterilized. So uh, uh, there's no uh, increase in the monetary basis of uh, the Eurozone. And we have a solution which, as, as, I, as I told you, doesn't violate each of the basic uh, 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 fundamental assumptions of the European monetary policy context. And this is, uh, this, the, the chart there shows what would be the cost of such a policy. And the cost is indicated by the black line there. So you can see that for the first year, uh, the cost is 60 billion uh, euros, and it uh, increasingly uh, decreases. At some point, it reaches zero, and then it becomes a gain for the European Central, uh, Central Bank. The overall cost, the cumulative cost, is less than one trillion, uh, which is comparable to the interventions. That's why I show you the liability side of the balance sheet. It's much comparable and, uh, to be honest, much lower than the interventions that the ECB had to do in order to deal with the financial crisis. So the cost might look high, but it's not incomparable and, uh, with what has happened uh, so far. And this is how a hypothetical development of debt, we're talking about all European countries, not just Greece, would develop in the wake of such intervention. Okay, um, the first, uh, the blue line shows what will be the debt dynamics on the optimistic assumptions about austerity, uh, which were in place in 2014. And the brown line underneath is our scenario, what will be the development of sovereign debt if such an agreement which, uh, uh, or such a solution will be uh, in implemented by the European Monetary Union. As you can see, the, the results are tremendous. And of course, if we, if we take into consideration that the cost is not impossible or it's in line with the trivial interventions of Central Bank, you have uh, an immediate estimation of the effectiveness of this policy. So these are similar uh, scenario estimations for other European countries. Uh, this applies to every country. So the benefit from this transaction is, uh, is a shared, you know, benefit for all European citizens. Um, so where does this leave us in relation to the uh, the basic starting uh, argument or question of this presentation. This is Karl Porlani. He was a very famous historian and anthropologist, 
uh, he's mostly famous for his uh, um, well-received uh, and well uh, much quoted uh, book, which his name is The Great Transformation, written initially in 1944. And it was written in a very particular time for Europe, which, I mean, in many different ways, it has some similarities with what is going on today, both in the economic and the political level. One of the points of Polanyi is that if, we have a, if you have a failing uh, economic order or a failing economic system which is struggling in order to find its space and its footing into, uh, into uh, the new economic environment, uh, it puts in place mechanisms and institutions uh, like you know, what we've seen with regard to the central banking. And despite, because the fact that these institutions are there, we can start discussing of how we can use or utilize the potentialities that they give us in order to come up with ideas of radical solutions to major problems that uh, 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 concern uh, the contemporary advanced, advanced uh, capitalist uh, societies. And from my point of view, this is a historical lesson that we need to take with us Today, what I would like to do with this discussion, with this argument and with this proposal is to show you the tremendous, tremendous far power and potentialities that are open to us on the basis of the current economic policy context. So I think it's, it's the time for us to start discussing radical ways in order to deal with important problems which influences many different aspects of our lives. Thank you very much. Thank you.